Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you all for um, attending this workshop, and thank you those that are watching online. This is being broadcast through Microsoft's network. I'm very pleased to introduce Kelvin Sung from University of Washington, Bothell. Kelvin's been doing XNA programming now for a few years. He's been doing talks around the world, including China and Mexico and other places. And the amazing thing about Kelvin is whatever country he goes to, whatever venue he goes to, he brings incredible enthusiasm to the, to the um, scenario. And he's... Um, quite popular as a result. His talks at Sig Sia are typically standing room only. And he's able to build the um, programming paradigm so that if you're not used to game pro programming, if you're not used to some of these more subtle graphics ideas, he's able to get you very enthusiastic, producing very compelling little um, examples in a short amount of time. And he'll demonstrate some of the things he's done at Guadalajara where he had people that hadn't programmed games before producing a really nice little game within a few hours. So um, thank you again for coming, for spending your Saturday with us, and Kelvin Sung from University of Washington, Bothell. Thank you, John. Um, so thank you very much on the, on the Saturday. Um, fortunately, it's raining or else I real very bad. I feel very bad. Um, and so, so what we're going to do today is that we're going to talk about doing game theme application development. And I say game theme because I'm not sure if we're doing games. You know, games are supposed to be fun. Um, so, so let me, uh, I'm going to switch around. And we should all have downloaded a zip file. And, and then if you look at the zip file, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go through the, um, oh, that's, that's, this is not the one I want to show you. We're going to go through basically everything on there. And I'm just going to bring up the, uh, at least I think I am. I'm going to go to bring up today's agenda, and then um, and then we'll see. Um, the, 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 the number of us here means that um, we can do this. The the uh, schedule can be very very flexible in terms of um, we can basically do whatever we want. Um, for for the, for about the next hour or so, what we're going to do is I'll show you how you can um, start up with XNA programming. Um, in about five minutes time. They, they really wrap this up very, very well. And then um, we'll, we'll let our brain rest a little bit. And then we will um, look at the way we wrapped X and A further and to uh, hopefully make things even simpler. And then um, we'll, we'll have some lunch. Maybe it's a bad idea to do this after lunch. But then I'm thinking that we'll spend about an hour, an hour and a half um, to write the uh, block breaker game in about an hour. And, and then you'll see that um, I, would, I shouldn't challenge you in terms of programming. Um, it's all how you, we put these things together. And then finally, what we'll do is, um, if we still have time, is I'll show you our approaches in wrapping your typical programming classes in games so that kids start to get confused and thought they're learning games. Um, but then we're actually teaching them programming concept. So that's kind of today's agenda. Um, I typically, this is a, like a three-day workshop agenda that's squeezing into um, <laughs> one day. So I'll speak a little bit fast, um, and then we'll see what happens. Um, so here is, um, I have a, a little bit of an intro. Um, and before even I, 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 we, we do anything, I, I really want to acknowledge the, the people I work with. I work with Mike Penn is quite, quite closely. He's from Cascadia Community College. So a lot of these ideas and, and um, this material were developed in collaboration with him. And um, I, I work with Robin Angadi and Becky Reed Rosenberg and David Goldstein from our campus. Um, Becky and Reed are our uh, teaching learning center people. They help us assess our student learning. So everything I present here, we test in our classrooms. And uh, we have interesting observation based on that. And Robin Angadi is uh, from our education program. She, um, she's actually an um, in-classroom expert. And Ruth Anderson and Jessica Bailey from other campuses, what they do is they help us evaluate what we have done and basically tell us our stuff is not good. No, that's not what they say. So they help us evaluate that. Um, I really want to thank um, Jennifer Carson and John Nollinger and Ken Foster for setting this up. And I'm not sure if Chris Hacking is here. Um, 
but Felice and, and Andrew are the two students who will be walking around. So the idea is that if you're not following and we don't like to dis disturb people when we're not following, you know, it's like if, if your program is not working, um, they will be spying behind your back. Okay, and then they will let, let us let me know, and then so let, let's try to have as much fun as we can. And this work is um, Microsoft has uh, very generously sponsored our work, and um, a lot of these things start with a NSF grant, where I, where I look at how do you uh, teach computer graphics uh, based on games, and then it results to all these things. Um, everything started with a, a grant from University of Washington Bothell, the Worthington um, Scholar Award. So that's kind of a little bit of a background and. Um, I gave you these websites just because um, th this is who I am. Um, this is my website. Um, well, I, there's no reason to bring this up actually. And and then uh, let me see. Oh, this is kind of interesting. So everything we talk, I'm going to talk about today is um, part of this project that we're working on. And if you have nothing else to do <laughs> when you're free, you're welcome to come and look at this thing. It summarizes what we're doing here. Um, so, so th those are the two things. And so, b before we begin, I want to see who I'm talking to, so I know I know how, when I can start uh, throwing really strange things at you. So, how many how many of here are uh, academ academics? Oh, cool. Uh, and then um, people from Microsoft. Well, I need to be really careful. Um, and and then, uh, how about programming language that you know? How many of us know C sharp? You can teach me. Actually, I really don't know C sharp. This is a wonderful. You don't need to know it to program it. How about C plus plus? Okay, so okay, you will have no problem. Java, we all, okay. <laughs> so you you have no problem following this thing. Um, how about uh, programming with a user interface, like uh, event driven programs? Okay. Um, and uh, how about graphics? How, how many of us write graphics programs? This, this is really cool. I really like the audience. Um, and my, my, our work is based on the premises that you do not need to know uh, graphical user interface programming or graphics programming to do games. And I, I hope we can verify that today. So, um, so I'm just wondering what, if, if we can figure out what you're looking for. Um, how many of us are here because you want to evaluate potential use for classroom? Yeah, we, we, we need to get together after uh, the workshop and, and see um, if, if there's any way that I can convince you um, to, to work with me on um, you know, bring some of these materials back into a classroom and, um, and we'll see. Um, so, so I have other stuff. Are, are there people who are here because they have nothing else to do? <laughs> no. Well, it's raining. So a little bit about me, my background. Um, I, I've been with the University of Washington Bothell for about 10 years now. Before that, I worked for a company you may not have heard of. It's a really small company in uh, Toronto. It's called Alias Wayfront. And they do it. They, they build a software called Maya. And I was, I was there um, working with them. I was actually one of the designers for the uh, first version of Maya's renderer. So I'm, 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 a, I'm a graphics person. I know a lot about uh, image generation. And um, you probably figured that out by now. I'm a foreigner, and I speak with a heavy accent. And I speak fast. And this stuff excites me, and when I get excited, I speak extra fast. So you, you guys, you guys have, have to be comfortable in slowing me down. My students don't slow me down. It's like after the quarter, you go like, man, half the time I don't know what he's talking about. Um, let, let's not do that. Just slow me down and go, you know, uh, be, 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 be comfortable with that. And then, I'm, like, like I'm saying, that, you know, the schedule is really flexible. We just do whatever we can do, and if, if, um, if we don't have fun, we just all go home. Um, Let's not do that. Uh, so, so anyway, so this workshop is about, um, I, I, I was really amazed. Um, I've been working with the graphics program starting from OpenGL and then I went to Direct3D. Um, when XNA came out, um, Evan Lumala actually, uh, he, he was one of our uh, contacts at Microsoft, called me up and said, you should try with this thing. And I downloaded it and looked at, wow, it's amazing. The amount of time it takes to actually start working with uh, graphics, and, and that was quite intriguing. And I want to share that with you. And even if you, you've never programmed with graphics before, you'll see this boom, it takes no time to start. And that's really good. And um, so th that's what I want to show you. And if, at this point, if you have some uh, graphical user interface background, you know, programming with, uh, with GUI and all that, um, humor me and, and let me know how I'm doing in terms of convince you this stuff is easy. Um, and then and then if you, you, you don't program with this before, at this point, let's take some opportunity to, to, um, 
to uh, uh, review the uh, model view controller framework because that's the framework we'll be working in. And as, as, you know, we, we're not going into too much of it. But then if we, we, look, we look at this slightly, and the, the, it's, it's kind of interesting that we'll be working with external uh, control programming model. And, and then let's start programming with pseudo games. The main goal here, is, the, the, the main goal of this entire workshop is that I, call, I keep on calling this thing game theme because it's just basically an uh, interactive graphical application. It's a really easy to start working with. And um, if we have another day, We'll, we'll look at how you can integrate this into uh, introductory computer science classes quite easily. So today, let's just have fun. Let's build a game. That's what I'll be doing. And um, well, like I said, give me feedback. Please slow, slow me down. Um, are there any, any questions before we start? And OK, no, no question. At least I know you are not reading internet. You know, it's like when, when in, in, in class, when student gets really quiet, you look at them and go like, are you guys serving the net? Mm -hmm. This is the, my newest thing. I say, everyone raise your hand, right? And then, no, no, you don't have to. You all, the student all raise their hand and say, stand up, go to the back of the room. And then I'll go check their monitor. <laughs> if it's on the network, then I'll shut down the machine, and then they can't open it up again in class. Or they, don't, they can't come to class again. So. Um, uh, it's not very good at building morale in class. So anyway, so I thought that we'll start by um, looking at uh, game console development. And that's what XNA is doing. It, it, it provides you with a very easy way to start doing game console development. And uh, I want to kind of talk about the model behind it. And, and, and let's start from there. So if you look at game console um, development, so if you want to develop a, a, a game for a console, a console like Xbox 360 or, um, or PS3 or whatever, it, the, the model is actually quite similar to what we're used to. Here's the source code you'll be developing. You'll be developing this based on some console API. Right? And then as you're developing this thing, typically the development environment is such that they have a runtime environment. These are the DLLs, the libraries, and all that. And everything will be running on the PC through some hardware emulator. So, so far, so good. There's no problem. And then what happened is that once you have something working, you will look at your game console on the side, and you have your piece of code of your program that runs. What you're going to do is, at that point, you have to pay the vendor a lot of money to get this uh, development kit. Oh no, this is their business model, so, so you have to respect that. But the, the, um, so this is really good for business and everything. And then the developer kit will help you download everything to the game. Um, it's good for business and everything, but then young kids get start to get excited about this thing. They want to go, hey, how can I do this at home? And I can tell you, I shouldn't, I'm, I'm being recorded. Uh, stories of people trying to develop for their own game console. They, try, they, they do really strange things to get that happen in the past. So what XNA did, guys did is they make this really, really simple, as we will see today. So uh, anyway, so um, if, if we compare this this kind of workflow thing that you have your your uh, uh, game your code, this is your code on some API to some developer uh, a developer kit you can load onto the hardware to our conventional programming environment where we have our source code, same color, and then we work with a group of API in game environment, environment. You have a lot of APIs you have to work with, and then you have your operating system. And then in some integrated development environment, and then when you are done, you run this on the CPU on, on your PC. So if you look at this, there's really no need to be different. They are exact identical. Conceptually, there's one-to-one -one mapping on doing game development and, and uh, for a console and developing your software on your PC. Um, and so based on this model, if you look at what's, what's going on here, is that um, there's my PC or my laptop. There's the Xbox. What the XNA guys did is that through .NET and co .NET Compact Framework, um, which runs direct 3D9. If that, those things that doesn't, make, that doesn't make sense to you, you don't have to worry about that. What they've done is that on top of that, they build this layer of API and functionality that's called XNA framework. By the way, the XNA guys are here. Um, so I'll say this very carefully. XNA doesn't stand for anything. Right? People keep on thinking that it stands for some acronym. As it turns out, it doesn't. So XNA is a brand. And then the collection of the library that X and they provide for provide for the for the for, for, for the programmer is called X and A framework. Okay, so that's very new. Um, Microsoft has this very interesting naming convention. .NET is a collection of I guess a system level library, 
and the names always threw me off. So anyway, so on top of on top of the XNA framework, they integrate the the library very very well with the integrated development environment. They call this XNA Game Studio, or this is C Sharp Express. So C Sharp Express is the integrated development environment, and it wraps around XNA such that you don't have to worry about the, the API, the functions at all, and you'll be developing your code in that environment. So what you have is a really well integrated environment. It just looks like Visual Studio or C Sharp Express. It's a, it's, a, it's a simpler version of Visual Studio. You do a development, and you compile, and you will compile to your PC application, you're done. And what they have done is that in two, in two mouse click, you can compile to Xbox 360. And then you can run your, your program on Xbox 360. Right? And um, that's what we're going to do today in the, in the first, first hour. We can probably do it in about uh, 20 minutes. And so I want to speak a little bit about the, the, this connection to Xbox 360. Your source code is trivial. You basically don't need to do anything, and we'll see that. And then um, what, what happened in reality is this thing, on your Xbox 360, um, by the way, we have that, right? So in our lab, we, we got a few of these things uh, through, this, through, through the grant uh, from, from Microsoft. Um, when I was doing my research, I realized I need um, one, one Sunday afternoon, because we need it on Monday, I need four um, Xboxes. So I went to the uh, Toys R Us on, on Sunday and go like, oh, I need four of those. And the guy looked at me like, wow, what's your problem? And then I saw, hey, there's an Elite. So I'll get one of those also. And my kids were with me, right? They go like, wow, so that's what you do in computer science. So you go buy Xboxes. Um, so I told them that they should start it hard so they can do research. And research means buying Xboxes. Um, so anyway, so, so, so what you have here is you, you, get, you have your Xbox, and then you have your code compiled on the PC. Um, the, one of the concerns of opening up this game console is that you, you, you open up the, uh, the uh, possibility for people to, to inject bad programs into the system. So what they, they've done is they want to make sure that they know who you are before they let you download, even for fun. So, the, so if you want to run your program on the Xbox 360, you would download a game. This is an application that runs on the Xbox 360. This game is called XNA Studio Connect. Okay, so this is an application that runs on Xbox 360. And then when you are ready to download your game, what you would do is through XNA Studio Connect, you will connect to Xbox Live. And they have all your backgrounds and they know who you are. So that you have to get, a, get an account here. And, and uh, after you connect it to the uh, Xbox Live, then um, XNA Studio will talk to your uh, XNA Game Studio there. So these guys will communicate, this guy and this guy. It's slightly more complicated than that, but basically these two guys will talk to each other, and they will load your game over, and then you can run it. So, it's, so to, to run this thing for security purposes is about two steps. So that, that's all, all I want to talk about. Oh, okay, and, and so, so, so that's how XNA works. And if you look at this thing, you know, we're going to throw away all the, the rest of the stuff. This is the key. Your source code runs on XNA, and, um, and then it runs in XNA Studio, Game Studio. This is C Sharp Express, or Visual Studio is the same um, environment. And um, this guy is really simple. But then if you've never worked with games before, you've never worked with graphics before, it can still be a little bit intimidating, as we will see today. So, um, so what you can do is, wh what we have done is that we kind of push your source code a little bit further away from XNA, and our goal is to make things even simpler. And I hope you will agree with me that it, it is indeed the case. And so, so today, that's the work environment we'll be working in. And you can actually, from your source code, if you want to, you can gain access to XNA framework, but um, you, you don't really need to for the type of programs that, that we will, will be developing. So, so that, that's, that's what we'll be doing today. And um, are there any questions on any of this stuff? It's kind of like a little bit of background. It's very interesting to talk about a product, a software, when the developers is just sitting in the back. They're, they're sitting there like taking notes and go, OK, that's wrong. Oh, uh -huh, now I know. By, by the way, um, this, this, I got this wrong for the longest time. I got this thing wrong because I really don't know what it's like. I just look at the code and read and then go, I think what's going on. So I came in one of the presentations, um, I think it was Mitch Walker sitting back and go like, no, 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 that's not what's going on. And that was really embarrassing. But he was really nice. In, and then so he, he told me um, that, that about this uh, .NET framework. OK, so, so anyway, so now, now, 
what we want to do now is, um, do we have the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the machines ready? If you don't, actually at this point, we're still okay. If you do have machine, you can follow along because we're gonna do something that's not very difficult. It may be too trivial to follow, okay? So if, if, you, have, um, if, you, have, if you have your um, environment set up and everything, there's this in Covisual uh, uh, C Sharp. We, we just open that. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna write our first uh, game program. If you just open that up, so I, I, I double click mine and uh, are we, are we okay? Are you guys following along? Do you want to? And then what, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, to create a new project. So you, you just come out here and say you want to create a new project. And then you will see that that is X and A. Th this guy's up here. If you don't have X and A uh, installed, what you will have here is an empty uh, development environment. If you have X and A installed, XNA is smart enough to tell Visual Studio that this is, this, these are the wizards that will help you create your projects. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a project and then analyze it to death. Can I say that? I did. Um, so we will actually figure out exactly what happened and all the things that they have done for us. So I'm going to take out my notes so that I, I know that I'm not missing anything. And we are going to create a Windows project, and it's actually quite exciting here, because if you look at the, uh, if you look at all the options we have, there are basically three uh, wizards here. You can create a, X, a Windows uh, 3.0 games, or you can create Windows game library. So th what this will do is it will create DIL for you, right? And then, oh look, Xbox 360, <laughs> and very excitingly, you can do Zoom games now. Um, the the library we have right now won't do Zoom. And uh, if we get more support, we will. Uh, the, uh, it's, it's, it's great. I tried it. It was just a lot of fun to, to, to have that, that little thing. And you can program your game on there. Um, so anyway, so let's, let's do a Windows game for now because we don't have all those devices with us. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to name my, my uh, Simple XNA, my project called Simple XNA. And I'm going to create subdirectory so that everything is just is separated. We can look at it clearly. OK, so we're going to do a Windows game, uh, and then um, I call it Simple XNA. By the way, every single source code that we go through here is on that CD. So if you can't follow this thing, or then if you mess things up, don't worry about it, because it's all in the CD. And what we're doing right now is we are looking at, I, I need to go back. We are looking at simple examples. So we're at 1B now. OK, I'll try to let you know where we are. Uh, as we move along. So we're at 1B and then we'll continue down. So now we, we, uh, we, just, we say that we're going to start with one of these things and then we, we click OK and it's going. And it, it, it will take a little while, uh, maybe a minute or so. Depends on how fast your machine is. And what this is doing is creating the entire project for you. And um, wizards are great. You get you started immediately. Um, for those of us who grew up a, a while ago, when people give you three files, and if you don't know what those three files are, you can't sleep at night. I can't. So when this works, and then here's the thing. If you, uh, if you come here and just do a build solution, um, and now, now it's compiling. Once it, it starts compiling, it, it goes really fast. And what you can do now is you can start, um, you can start without, we just start without debugging. And when our first games program is ready, it's not very impressive right now, but then still. The, the thing, though, is that at this point, um, I get nervous because too many things have been done for me. Um, and, and, then I, 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 and, and what I want to do is I want to kind of go through that with you. So what we have here is we have a very simple shell program. And if we look at all these, all these things that's been, been done for us, it's actually quite uh, scary. And what, what we want to do now is we want to analyze what's going on. There's all the files that's been given to us. And, and, and we want to go through that. Uh, are we OK? Are, are there any questions? Am I going too fast, too slow, too boring? We don't care. Um, so anyway, so the, the, the thing that we want to do now is we want to look at the files that's been created for us. And um, I created my project on my desktop. And sure enough, there's this thing called Simple XNA. So what, what we want to do is we want to look at the development environment and we want to look at the file system and see what are the things that the wizard created for us and what are those things for. 
So if, if we, we come here and look at the file system, we see that here's the uh, simple uh, XNA, and this is the solution file that describes how to build the solution. This, this simple XNA.sln is this guy right here. So that's one to one. This solution is represented by this file. And if, if, you, uh, if you don't believe me, I'm going to start a, uh, I'm going to start a text editor. So um, I'm going to start a notepad. So here's a notepad. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag this solution file into the notepad. You don't have to do this. I just showed you what's, what's in there. And if we take a look at this notepad file, this is the solution file. Okay? And we, we can see that it's actually quite simple. This is a description on how you will build um, your project. And you know, these are unique ID numbers, so they know exactly what to do. So that's fine. And then this, we don't really know what, uh, what that is. The thing, though, is that we do know is that, hey, here's my project name. It's called Simple XNA. And then here's my solution name. And then there's this file that looks like a file in a folder. It's called simple xna slash simple xna.csproj. OK, so what we're seeing here is it's description of where to find the project. So here's the project. And if we look at that, this is the solution that's called simple xna. It tells us that to, um, in this simple xna solution, there's a project called simple xna. I'm going to come out here and look at under simple xna, that's a, that's a folder name. And by the way, notice this one-to-one -one thing. Here's the folder, and that's the folder. So it's actually referring to the file system for you. And then in there, there's a CS project file. And that file describes how to build your system. Right? So the solution file tells us where to go look for the project file. And the project file is actually in this folder. By the way, all these things you can change. So I'm going, to, I'm going to show you. You don't have to follow this thing. I'm going to select my project. This is my project. I'll change the project name. So you can do a right mouse button and then say rename. I'm going to rename this project to say whatever. And we will notice that, no, that we will notice that this is changed to whatever. So it is one-to-one. -one. It actually describes everything for you. And um, I'm going to hide away my, my, uh, uh, my Explorer now. The interesting here is the Explorer lets you see the file system. In the development environment, this solution uh, Explorer is exactly like your Explorer. It lets you see the file system and more. So in, in, I'll show you. What we can do here is that there are three buttons here. This middle button says shows all file. And this will show you all the files in the uh, file system. So we can see that there's bin, there's content, there's OBJ. These are the files that, that are not part of the project so that they, they don't show you. So you can hide this. We just want to know that we're seeing that. So what we're seeing here is a one-to-one -one mapping. This is the actual file system. You can, if you come out here and change your file name, the file name will be changed on, on your hard drive. You come out here and delete the file, the file will be deleted from the file system. What you can do is you can remove files from being part of the project. So I can come out here and say, um, I exclude this file from the project. And what that will do is it will exclude the file. But then the file will still be on the file system. So we can do that. I'm going to exclude this file from the file system. So it's gone. But then, because I can see the entire file system, I can click and say, oh, here's the file. We see the color is different. And I will say, uh, include it back into the project. So you can actually do that. Okay? So this is, this is quite one-to-one. Uh, -one. Um, besides that, um, so we can examine all the files we have by just looking at this folder here. Um, the uh, assembly info, if we look at that, assembly info basically describes how you want to build your, how you want to build your program. Um, this assembly title, this is the, this is the title bar. Um, so I'm going to change this to my whatever and see what happens. So if, if I recompile this and run, I will see that um, it changed the Windows name out here. Okay? So, so what we're seeing is that the, everything that um, the system gives us, we can, we can change. And we want to have some sense of what, what, they, what those things are. This icon right here, this icon right here is this game.ico. So you can change that also. You can change that into anything you want. And, and then um, this guy right here, um, game thumbnail, uh, let me show you. OK, how do I go back of oh, projection? What that is, is oh, I switch off my Xbox.
remember what, what we're doing here. We are, I, I'm, I'm in the process of trying to show you um, what is this file for, this file right here. This file is for this. Uh, students love this. That file is this. So they can put their, their face on their project. It's, you know, they go, wow. And they do a very interesting thing with that idea. Um, so, 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 we see, so now we understand what's the ICO file. We understand what is this. And um, I'm going to hide away the files I don't need in here. The, um, the program file, this is a dummy uh, container. This is a dummy container. And then this is like, if you, if you write Java program, this is the static main. And you'll start running your program from here. Um, and then we see that in your main function, what you do is you create a game that calls game one, and game one is our source file. So that's a, a, the only file we need to worry about. The rest of the files are, are our supporting. And because we kind of have went through what's going on here, I hope you agree with me that this is not that scary. Uh, in the beginning, when you see like seven or eight files created for you, for me at least, um, I get nervous. So if you look at game one.cs, we open up game one.cs, um, it looks a little bit intimidating and then until we start to try to um, classify what we're seeing according to functionality. So um, one, one nice thing about C-Sharp Express, the uh, development environment, is you can close things up. So, um, so we can see that here I have a namespace. It's, is that the, the, the terminology they use in Java that you can create namespaces? I think in C++ you can do the same thing. I, I get so confused by this, all this syntax and I don't know which language is what. Um, this using is basically include in C++, C++ or uh, import in Java. So we're seeing that we are including a bunch of XNA framework um, uh, libraries. So we're, we're working with a bunch of, whole bunch of libraries, fine. So this is include stuff, I'm gonna close that up. And this is my namespace. If I open up my namespace, I can see that all I have is one class. Okay, and then with that one class, I, I, have, a, I, have, a, I have an interactive uh, game that I can develop. And then we see that the, your class name is game one. We, we've already seen that this game one was called from this program. So we can change this to anything we want um, as long as we change it consistently. So if I come out here and change it to my game, what I need to do is I need to come to my program here and make sure this is my game. And then... Um, Notice the, uh, the IDE is very, very nice. It, it, it does continuous uh, syntax checking for you. Sometimes it gets on your nerve, but most of the time it's really nice. So now, now I, I just changed my, 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 my class name. So that's my class, so fine. And then if we open up this class, this is the slightly uh, intimidating part. Um, well, first of all, I need, I need to make sure that my, my construct is the same name as my, my game. And then I'm gonna close up all these things and we, we, we can do that. So I'm just gonna close up everything that I can close. And then we'll realize that, that we, can look, we can analyze the structure of the framework they provide us. And this is where our knowledge in a model view controller may come in a little bit handy here. We see that, oh, here's my class. There are two really scary looking objects that's in the class. But then besides that, we see five functions. We have a constructor, we all know what that is. There's a protector override initialize function. There's a load content, unload content, update, and draw. So there are five functions provided for us, and based on this framework, you can do really interesting game programming. So what does these five functions do? Um, constructor will initialize our, 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 our memory. And then, so, so now the, the knowledge of model view controller comes in handy. What we have here is the controller and the view. It's the view, con it's the view controller pair here. So view controller pair, if you remember the um, model view controller framework, these guys are responsible for getting user input and providing output of the application state. Okay, so what we have here is that we're going to initialize ourselves. This is the protocol X XNA implicitly defined for us. They will call us at the initialization stage. So you initialize your variables. After that is done, XNA is going to go do some initial, its own internal initialization, and then it's going to turn around and call you to load content. Content is a general description of anything that's not in, inside your code. So if you're writing uh, a games program, what you need is you need a lot of images to make your game look interesting. You need to have audio files. And those loading will happen here. You have to load your content. And then, so you initialize, you load your content. And then when that is done, what happened is that it will continuously call you update and draw update and draw. And this is where you will change your application state 
and then you draw your application state. So the, the, the protocol then is very, very simple. You initialize your application state. You load in all the resources you need. All the resources are like the images and the audio files. And continuously update and draw. And that's what the game is. Initialize, update, and draw. So let's, let's, we can verify that this is indeed happening. So each one of these is a protective function, meaning that it's defined in the base class in the XNA framework. And they enforce this uh, protocol for us, which is kind of nice. Well, kind of, it's very nice because it makes things very easy. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to, you don't have to follow this thing. Um, I'm going to put in breakpoints in each one of these functions to verify that the, the protocol that we understand is indeed happening. So I'm going to put in breakpoints in each one of these guys here. I'm going to put a breakpoints unlock. So I guess I need to have some code in here. And then I'll put in a breakpoint here. And then I will also put in a breakpoint here. And I'll put in a breakpoint in draw. I'll put a breakpoint in draw right here. So here I have all I have breakpoints in each one of these functions, and then I'm going to run my program now. So I'm I'm, I'm running uh, with the debugger on, and let me make sure that this goes away. So indeed, the first thing that happened is that my 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 uh, my program stops in initialize. Okay. So after initialization is done, what will happen is that it should call load. So every, all the resources are allocated, all the all the system um, objects are allocated. It will call load. I, I, when I say continue, you come to load. And at this point, our job as programmer was supposed to load in all the resources we need, all the uh, file texture, all the audio files, so that we can start using them. And I'm going to type, uh, type F5 now. What that will do is let, let the program continue. F5, it comes to update. At this point, you will change your application state according to user input or according to your AI in your, in your game. And then when I type F5 again, it will, it will continue to execute. It will come, oh, it's still in update. Oh, it will come to draw. So what happened, what just happened there? Because this is a real-time system, you don't need to draw your system real-time. What's real-time? Like really, there's time? No. Um, real-time is, is about, um, you need to update your, your screen about 60 times a second. If you update your screen like 100 times a second, you have a really sharp display. If you update your screen 200 times a second, uh, that's really unnecessary. So what happened here is that XNA will call draw about 60 times a second, no more. There's no need to do that more. But it will call update as soon as it has a chance. So in between draw, there's many update going on. We okay with that? That's what happened. So if I keep on continue here, it's going to go to update, 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 update. Eventually, it will call, go to draw. Come on, go to draw. I, I prom oh, do we see draw? Oh, so anyway, so, so we, we can see that many updates happen one draw. Many updates happen one draw because I have nothing in here. So what we have done is we verify the framework, what, what they are doing for us. And, and then um, we, we can run this program and get a really uh, interesting uh, blue screen. Um, but then, yeah, yeah. Um, what we can actually do is we can actually develop code based on this. So what we're going to do now is that we will um, try to draw with this. Okay, and let's see what, what's involved in drawing and what's involved in actually, we can actually develop a game based on this framework. It's just the code will be a little bit, um, well, well, we'll see, it's, it's actually not that hard. So, so what, what, what we have done so far is if you look at, look at the schedule that we're trying to follow is I hope we are about only half an hour behind. Um, so we, we are uh, done with 1B, gee, I will speak fast. Um, so what we're going to do now is let's look at drawing with XNA, and then let's look a little bit with interactive control. Um, if you have your, um, if you have your, not you, if you look at your um, download the zip files, and if you unzip that, um, this this is organized into uh, what we're going through in section one here. And then if we just open up section one. If we just open up this section one, we went through the background, here's the PowerPoint, and then we went through simple XNA, that's what we just went through. Let's look at drawing with XNA, okay? And um, this is a source file we'll start working with, and then let's just double click on that. One thing I want you to kind of, I want you. <laughs> I have to be careful, I don't know how to speak very well. Um, under 1C here, this is where under 1C, there's a folder called useful file. If you, you double click this useful file, you will see a JPEG image. We will draw with that JPEG image. Yes? Okay. 
So, so that, let's let's take let's take, take a ten minute break. How many people need Calvin CD? That's oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There are two keys floating around, and then I have CD here. Oh yes, thank you. Yeah. Oh, thumb drive. Oh, do we have another? Oh yes, thank you. Yeah, right here. It's right here. Um, are, are we are we okay now to to with installation? Okay, we good. So so we can. I'm I'm going to go now. No, I mean I don't mean I'm going to go. I mean we can start again now. And so um, this is where we are. Oh God, I don't know where. The, this is where we are. We are going to we are going to um, we are going to look at drawing with X and A, okay. And then to, to look at drawing with X and A, instead of recreating the project and everything, we're going to come to one C. This file you've just unzipped under section one C. So I'm going to go into section one. Let, let me do it this way. I'm going to section one C. So I'm in section one C now. And then there's a source code. Notice that there's a useful file folder. We just want to be aware of that folder. And then we come back out here. I'm going to go into source file, open up the source file. And then this source file is basically the empty uh, structure that the, um, the wizard will create for us. So if you look at the game1.cs right now, it is come. Oh, actually, I put in the code already. Um, so you have the code. What should I do? Let's, um, let's create it from scratch it's because it's more fun. So my apology. Let's start. Let's, let's recreate a new project. So let's just. I just restarted my uh, Visual C Sharp, and then I'm going to come and say new project. We've done this before. New project on desktop, I'm going to create my, say, draw. This program, I call it draw, and I'm going to call, call, call this guy draw. OK? And I'm going to say OK, and you will create an empty project for me. And the, the only thing, so you create an empty project for me. The only thing you need to remember is where is your useful file folder, because we need, we need that image. And and what I'm going to do now is that I am going to uh, do what I said we should do is that I'm going to draw a Microsoft um, logo um, because we're in Microsoft right now. And to, do, to draw a Microsoft logo, this is what I will do. I will create an object so I can draw with. So what I've done is that I come to the class area be above my constructor. I'm going to create an instance variable here. And the instance variable I'm going to create is called texture2d. OK? Hey, look at this. This, uh, this, this. this ID really spoils you. If you type in T, it echoes it out. And at this point, if you type tab, it will do auto expansion for you. Okay, if you get used to this and you start typing your code, you see tab all over the place. Because when I start coding, I don't look at what I'm typing. Um, I'm going to call this guy, give this guy a name, I'm going to call it my logo. I wish it's mine. Um, so this is my instance variable. And what I will do is I will instantiate this uh, uh, instance variable because this guy is not a real uh, object. It's, it's, it's kind of like a, a, a stub. I'm going to load the texture for this um, at load time. So during initialization, I don't need to do anything. During load content time, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to load in that logo. So something I call, see that? I don't need to actually remember what, what my logo. I'm going to get content dot load texture 2D. I'm going to raise this thing slightly. So inside load content, I'm going to actually load the content into a target in my code. And the, uh, I need to give you a parameter. And the name of the, uh, the parameter is called ms. OK? So I'm loading in something, and then I, the, the thing I'm loading in is called my logo.
now, now that I have this object loaded, what I want to do is I want to draw it. And then I'll come all the way down into the draw function. Into the draw function here, I will say, um, I want to say my, oh, it's not that simple. Be careful now. So what I want to do is I want to do spread, sprite bread, draw um, begin. And then I will say my logo dot draw, and I'm, I'm sure that you are all very annoyed because you don't know what's going on. So what I'm what I'm doing here in a nutshell is that inside the draw function, I'm telling the system, hey, I want to begin drawing now. So I will say sprite batch. If you notice, this is an instance variable I created in the class. I will say sprite batch dot begin, saying, hey, I'm ready to draw now. And then I will tell my object, you draw yourself my logo dot draw. And then I will tell the system that I'm done drawing, say sprite batch dot end. If you have that type in, we'll have, to, we'll have to put in more. Because I have to tell myself where I'm drawing to. So here I will say I'm going to draw to a new position. And I'm just going to draw at 200, 200 for the sake of it. And I will uh, draw with color white. It, it doesn't seem to like my, uh, I, th I think I'm OK. I'm going, I'm going to compile now. We're done. We, we can draw now. So I'm going to compile now. Go to build and build solution. Let's see if I get an error. I do get an error. Does not contain them. Draw. Wait. Pardon me. I'm, I'm going to look at, I'm going to delete this thing and look at the uh, syntax for draw now. Dot. Ah, sorry, sorry. It's sprite batch dot draw, and my logo, and then I'm going to draw it to. As you can see, I know XNA really well. So if this is what this is what we do, I tell the sprite, sprite batch, I'm going to draw now. What am I drawing? I'm drawing my logo. I'm drawing at a position 200, 200 with color white. And then I say I'm done. Yes? Is Sprite Batch like a container? And if so, why didn't we add my logo to the batch? To the you you don't add it to the batch sprite batch is um, how do how how it's a it's a it's an object that they provide you that's kind of interface to drawing so you you, you don't add object into the batch you kind of initialize it I'm ready to draw to kind of initialize it and then you draw to it and then you can close it and, yes you have your own object and you are responsible for making sure it's strong. It doesn't compile. It does? That does it run? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not? We don't have the logo. So as it turns out, every resource you put into the system, you have to tell the system where it is. So what we're going to do now is we have to give the logo to the system. So and this is how this is how we'll do it. I'm going to um, drag drag this back out. That's what this content project is all about. It lets you uh, put your resources that you need at runtime into the system. And this is what I'm going to do. Don't blink. Now, if you blink, you're going to miss this. I'm going to go to my 1C useful file and see my MS logo. Are we OK? You find that file? OK? And the workflow is exactly like how you work in uh, Explorer. I'm going to drag this file. Be careful who you drop it. I'm going to drag it to content. We OK with that? I'm going to release, boom, it's in there. Now what I've done is I've included this image as part of my project. OK? And then now if you compile and run, it's going to work. 
So I'm compiling and I'm running. Um, oh, I have my Microsoft logo. Do we all have our Microsoft logo? We okay? Okay, so what we have done is we put in like six lines of code and you have a logo out there and believe it or not, I'm gonna show you how you can interact with this logo. Um, and and uh, from the olden, olden days, that's kind of incredible. Okay, and what we want to do is want to make this slightly simpler because I don't know about you, I was quite scared when I first started doing this thing. A lot of magical things you need to do. So um, um, before, we, before we go away, let's verify the um, model view controller framework in terms of what's going on. And um, here I'm doing my draw, and I'm drawing my logo, and then at update, what I can do is I can change my application state. So I'm gonna make my application slightly more sophisticated. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to come all the way back up here into where I declare my logo. I'm going to create an instance variable to tell myself where I'm going to draw. So I'm gonna come out here and create instance variable called vector2. So if you just type in VE tab, it will give you vector2. And I'm gonna call it, call it pause for my position. Okay? And now we are working in C sharp, it's managed code. It works exactly the way uh, like Java. For any object you have, you need to allocate memory. Uh, you can allocate your memory in, in the constructor or in initialize. I'm gonna allocate my memory in initialize. So I'm gonna come to my initialize function and anywhere in there, I'm going to initialize my position. Position gets new, and notice that if you, if you notice the, um, the help intelligence that comes up, a lot of tabs will, will give you all these uh, few lines of code. So let's do this again. This is in initialize. I'm gonna initialize position. I'm gonna type P, it's gonna give me pause. And then I will say it's equal to new. And then it knows that I need to initialize a vector two. So at this point, if I type tab, it will just give me the, uh, uh, the class name. Don't get used to that because you can't go, can't go back. So it's difficult to go back after games. So now if my, my position initialized, um, you can actually provide it with uh, instance variables. I mean, you can provide the, the constructor with, um, you know, I'm going to initialize it to 200, 200. Now that I have a fancy variable that I can use, when I come to draw, instead of just drawing there, I'm going to go all the way down here into my, my, uh, my draw function. And in, in my draw function, I'm going to expand that now. Instead of recreating this every time, I'll just passing my, my position. So now I have my position. Um, if I run the program, I will get exactly the same output because I didn't change anything, right? Instead of just creating that every time, I pass in variable. So, so we, we can compile this thing. If I, I, I just compiled it and if I run it, then we will see the same logo that uh, not interesting at all. But then what we have now is that my application state is the logo and, the, and, and, it's the logo and, a, uh, and a position. So what I can do is I can change the position. So what I, I'm going to do now is that I am going to come into, I'm going to come into my update function here in, in my update function. I'm going to say every time when I update, I'm going to figure out what's going on. So for example, what I can do now is don't blink. Well, actually you can, please blink. I'm going to say if keyboard dot get state, this is why, um, get state dot key is key down key start arrow up. I just want to say up. Are you impressed that I can remember all that? <laughs> I can't. The intelligence help is a great thing. So, so what happened here is that in the update function, I want to check my up arrow key. So I say the keyboard, this is a system resource, get the state, and I want to check if the up key is down. If the up key is down, what I want to do is, I don't know, let's just um, increase my, uh, my Y value. So if the up key is, is, is being pressed here, what I want to do is I want to say my position dot Y gets, let's, let's increment that. Okay, so what's gonna happen now? Now we can compile the program. If we build the solution and we can run, 
And now, do we all have our, our, and then if you press the up key, what's going to happen? Boom, it's dropping down. Do, do we have this in dropping down? Anybody has any question? It depends on how old you are, but then having your uh, origin at the top left is not something um, I like or we should like. Um, a lot of games are like that. You know, it, it's difficult to teach with that, saying that, okay, forget about Cartesian coordinate you've learned. Let's assume Y goes downwards. Like, that's not very good. But that, that's how the Howard guys think, right, because of the uh, TV days. You know, you think that that's 50 years ago, half a century ago, they can let that go. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so now what we, are, what we are verifying is that I have a state, I have, I have my, my object, and then at, at drawing time, I take this together and present an image for you. And update, what I can do is I can change my state and I'll draw, update, draw. So now we can see this thing coming down. And then what that means is that if we want to do something slightly uh, fancier, is that we can come out here and say, I am going to make my object just fly. So what I'm doing here is that this is in my update function again. In my update function, instead of changing the value according to user input, I can change it automatically, right? So if I compile now and run, so here's the thing. So far, I didn't teach you anything at all. I'm just showing you how to use this thing, except maybe one thing. If you like console programming, programming with uh, uh, character I.O., you are always in control. You have your while loop and all that going on. It's internal control model. So you have to switch this around. We're working with the external control model. We don't have the central control anymore. We have to get used to the idea that somebody's calling us. So if you want to change state, just change one at a time. I'm not going to put a while loop over this and say while and x go. That's a very difficult thing to switch out of. But then once you get used to that, I'm going to compile this now. If you type Control Shift B, it will control. It will compile, and then Control F5, it will run. And then I'm going to see my uh, I, I'm going to see my Microsoft logo. If I press my key down now, it's actually I, we should make this go up. Going down is not good. Um, so anyway, so we can do we can do all this. Are we okay so far? And that's it. What else do I have to say about uh, programming with XNA? Oh, the, the other thing I, I want to say about programming with XNA is the fact that you can actually load um, this program right here onto the Xbox 360. And let me show you how. You guys have Xbox 360 with you? No. no. So you, you can only watch me do this now. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to come out here with my right mouse button click. We can see that they come with translators for you. You can create your project as an Xbox 360 project or Zoom. You can actually compile this as Zoom and load it onto Zoom, which is kind of cool. So I'm going to compile this, uh, pro, pro, create this project as Xbox 360. So if I click on that, what happened is that I have a separate project it's called Xbox 360. I'm just going to name it something slightly less uh, scary. So I'm just going to call it my uh, X project. Okay, and then if you open up this project, you're going to see the same source structure. As it turned out, they share the same source code. And if, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the, the folder that contains the work, so um, this is what my project is called, what did I call my project? Draw, thank you very much. So inside Draw, I'm going to see two CS x.cs project, that's my Xbox project. I'm going to see my window game.cs project, that's my window game project. I do not see copies of the source code. So program.cs and game1.cs, there's only one copy of each one of those. So the project describes the same source file. And then it's capable of telling the system how to build, based on the same source file, build the build executable. So if you look at this, this, everything is shared here. So I can open up this file from here. It says this, pro this file's document is opened by another project. That's because I opened it up here. So it's the exact same document. If you change something, both of them will see. And in almost 90% of the time, and everything we can do here, it runs both on Xbox and on, um, and on PC. Okay, so, so all those, are, all, all those are, are, are good and all that. And what I can do now, so the only thing difference is these references. This is a link, link library. These libraries are different. For Xbox 360, they have a different binary set. So, so that's the only thing different. So at this point, what you can do is you can build and you can deploy. 
And if you have your thing set up right, when you say deploy, it's going to ship it to Xbox 360, and you can, you can play that just like a regular game. And part of deploy is the checking security right, that you had talked about earlier, that all happens. Well, actually, before, what, right before uh, before. let me show you that. Um, what, what you need to do on the Xbox 360 is this. So you have your Xbox 360, you will come to your, you know, if you bring this stuff to class, you're suddenly the most popular professor on campus. <laughs> Until they realize programming is still hard. But then they're more motivated, you know? Um, so anyway, so you come to all games, and what you will do is you will run this program called XNA Studio Connect. And what this program will do is it will talk to the IDE and let you do the deployment. And I can't do that for you right now because I can't go online right now. Because you just go online and check my ID and know that I can't go online. Otherwise, I'll do that. And not only can I, see, this is the program that, that um, I deployed last night. Um, not only can I not go online, I can't, I can't even run this. In order to run these progr programs, you have, to be, um, you have to sign up. One good thing about this thing is all these programs, after students are done developing them, they can sell it. Um, Xbox Live Hobby, or no, Xbox Live, help me. Xbox Live something. They have, they have three of those um, communities. There's uh, Xbox Live for professional, and then there's for, uh, pub, for, for, for people who are a hobby. And what you can do is you can develop all this game and sell it on Xbox Live uh, as a hobbyist, and then you know, each game sells for like a buck. And you keep 80 cents of the profit. And last year, Sufi, uh, one of her classmates, um, built a game after my class and sold it, and he, they ranked number eight. Yeah, and I told him to not stop coming to school. I'm thinking, that, well, look, he'll be a millionaire. Uh, he's still there, so I'm not sure how much money he's making. But, but anyway, so if you, you can run this same thing, and the program works in exactly the same way. There's nothing spectacular about it, except that now you can you know, show it to your grandma at home, and then grandma will think that you are smart. So, so, so that's all I want to show um, for, for, uh, about programming with X and A. And this is, uh, yes? So how do we, I mean, we, we, we uh, <coughs> added the, the keyboard handling. Yes. But if you want to add the, the control. That's such an excellent question. What do we do? The question is that um, we have keyboard control. We have up arrow and down arrow and all that. On the Xbox, what are you going to do? As it turns out, this won't run on the Xbox because there's no such input device on the Xbox. So on Xbox, oh look, there's something called gamepad. So what you can do is you, you don't, don't, don't follow this thing. I'm just going to show you what some of the uh, interface functions are. So if you come out here and you go like uh, if gamepad, gamepad dot um, um, get state um, player index one, four, whatever, um, there are buttons, there are um, there are, um, there are thumbstick, there are triggers, and all the devices. And it's really, really simple to work with this, right? Because that's all you need to do. Uh, it can be a little bit overwhelming with this thing. So for that reason, what we've done is we have developed our library. So we're going to put a layer of code on top of this thing. So for, for those of us who are just not really into this much stuff, may, we'll make things slightly simpler. Okay, and th this was a, this is uh, supposed to be at about 11, we're at 11:30 now. So I'm just going to zoom continue. Okay, so we we are let's let's look at the library and the library that we're providing. I'm going to close this now, and I'm pretty sure the next one I have it right. So I'm going to open up my uh, I'm going to open up my directory my folder structure. And we are done with section one. I'm going to co come into section two now. And section two has four projects. We're going to go through the, the first two here. Um, and then inside simple circle. So what I want to do is I want to show you beginning of the program and end of the program so that we have a place to start. OK, so we're going to start with this begin template. It says just empty template. We'll look at that. And then after that's done, this is where the source code is. And the reason I'm giving you this is so that if you get lost somewhere down the line, don't get very nervous. It's OK. So I'm going to look at begin template now. And inside begin template, once again, you kind of need to know where this folder is because we, we, we kind of need it a little bit. We will see three files in there. We will see a font file. We will see two DLLs, OK? So one font files and two DLLs. And these two DLLs 
are the library that we're providing you. So, so let's, let's look at the source folder now. Remember where this folder is. If we look at the source folder, double click on that, and what that will bring up is, this is, my, uh, this is, this is our uh, wizard. It's a whole lot less impressive than Microsoft Wizard. But, and then the, the file structure, the folder structure, everything is identical. The only thing that's different is if you open up game1.cs, um, we see something slightly different. Same namespace and all that. The only thing different is that the, the game1 program, instead of inheriting from the long XNA, you'll be inheriting from our provided base class. So this base class will wrap XNA on, uh, off from, from us, okay? Anybody has any question? Are, are, we, are we okay here? I can't get it to compile, so I missed something somewhere along the line. It's the syntax. Oh, okay. Um, if, if, if you are stuck trying to compile the um, XNA program we have earlier on, don't get too concerned with that. There are two purpose of do, purposes of doing that, and it's kind of contradictory. The first reason for doing that is to show you it's not that difficult to do it. The second reason of showing you that is it's really complicated. So if you can't get it to compile, it's okay. Because I kind of want to see, let you see that. Although it's not that difficult, it can be quite challenging. And this is the interface. So if you come to this, this folder, this is the interface we have. We in inherit from our library, and we can see that we are using our library. We use our library, and we inherit from our library. And instead of having five functions as an interface, our library has two. There is initialize, there's update. You don't have to worry about drawing, which is actually a, a mixed blessing because it can be a curse. Um, so you, you only need to worry about creating your world and drawing your world. And at this point, <clears throat> we can actually compile. So if you come out here and just build, build your solution, it will fail. And then the reason it failed is because we didn't include the DLL as part of our environment. So we need to actually go include that. So to include a DLL into an environment, you come to references. This is where you specify what are the libraries you need. If you right click on the references, you can add a reference. Now you're adding a library into your system. You, you add reference, and then you go look for the file that we were looking for just now. It takes a while for this to load up. So you go look for the file we, we, we examined just now, and you want to add in the PC version of the DLL. We give you the Xbox version so that you can, anything you, you, you do here, you can run on Xbox. Um, this is taking a while. And then what we want to do here is we want to browse. And I think if you go up two folders, you will see the useful file folder. And this is the file we want to include. OK? Are we okay with that? I'm going to include that. Now, now this is included. Now I can, I can compile my program now, and I can run. And I can, I can, I can, I can you know, I'm just going to run, I'm going to run my program now. And it's just like X and A, it's completely empty. Yeah? So that library is your, is this your library that you wrote? Or is yeah. It yeah. Right. Yeah, um, yeah, it's, 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 I don't know how to say this well, but it's incredibly simple to write that library. Okay. Uh, once you've done it. So it's, it's a very simple library. But then it's a very simple library. However, it's, uh, we can also do interesting thing with that. So what we're going to do now is we're going to create a circle. So I'm going to come out here in the instance variable place. I'm going to type x and a, and then you will see that there's a whole bunch of classes that you can, you can choose from. You just type X and A, and then I'm going to go down the uh, IntelliSense th with a circle. So I'm going to create a new circle. And I'm going to call this um, M-Circle. 
because we're in Microsoft, I'm going to follow their, uh, I'm going to follow their convention. M dash means things are, um, in, uh, are, are part, of the, uh, part of the class. So that you can differentiate between instance variable and local variable. And we want to, uh, want to initialize that circle. Let me, let, me, let me get ourselves into a place, and then I will come help those of you who are a little bit stuck. So here is, I'm going to uh, instantiate a circle. So the, the, the idea is the same thing. I'm going to instantiate my object, in initialize, and I'm going to update it in update. So I'm just going to instantiate my circle. And then the syntax for this is uh, circle is equal to, I don't, I'm going to new now, and I'm going to new a circle. And um, the place I'm going to create it, let's create it a new vector, um, new vector two um, at 200 by, um, well, let, let's do it at 50-50. How about that? 50-50, and then the radius of my circle, let's create it as 3. Can we see the entire thing? Let me, let me close that up. Type that in, compile, and then you will have a circle. It's just, it's just a slow. Oh, so, yeah, oh, this machine. Steps behind. Oh, okay. So, all morning, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so um, if you, you now you compile this and run, you'll see a circle. I promise you. So I just compiled, and if I run, I see a circle. Right. So now you know you don't have to worry too much about all these things. And then what you can do is let's um, in update world let's change information about that circle. So I, I, what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to say my circle's center, let's move it up. Uh, uh, let's move it down because it's so high up right now. Circle dot um, center dot uh, center uh, x, um, I'm going to increment that. And my circle dot center uh, y, I'm going to decrement that. How about that? And then if you compile this and run, the circle will just move. So all I did is I put in two lines of code, and then the circle will now move. And, and if we want to, what we can do is instead of moving the circle automatically, this is AI, right? When, when you talk about in-game AI, that's what that is. Your object can move by itself. So what we can do here is that we can, um, let's change my circle according to my thumb stake. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say my circle dot center um, add equal to game pad dot, um, let's say thumb stake dot left. So this is a instance variable in the system. It will give you the uh, vector two of the left thumb stake. So this is, this is the thumb stake that we, we, we will be working with. It's going to uh, work with the left, left thumb. Let's use the right one because the right one is, is, is easier to work with uh, on, on the PC. So I'm going to just map this to the right thumb stick. So this, this thumb stick right here. And th what this device does is that it gives you a, a floating point range between minus one to positive one in the X and Y direction. So that's why we can do that. Okay, now if we compile this and run, and I'm going to run this now, you can actually move your circle with the arrow key. So what, what, what we have done in our library is that if you are running on the PC, we map all your keys to uh, all, all the, all the uh, controller in, uh, functionality to your keyboard. And if you're running on the Xbox, then you would just use the Xbox controller. And then if you can plug this stuff in into, onto your PC. So I do, always go to class now with my Xbox controller, and I'm really popular in school. Uh, so, so now what I can do now, if I run this thing, and I can control this with my, my, my it's exactly the same thing as though, um, you know, it's the same. Um, so we, we are drawing with, uh, and, and oh, I want to echo messages. I want, to, I want to show users something. And for that, what we need to do now, font is not part of the library. So if you want to do anything, you have to provide it with the information. So um, this is the part where, because the library is so uh, simple to work with, it's also really, really rigid. And your students don't need to know this, but you kind of do. So I'm going to bring up my, my solution explorer now. 
my solution explorer, in order for the system to see fonts, what I need to do is I need to create a folder under content. So I'm going to come to content and do a right mouse button and say add a new folder. What this will do is will actually new, add a new folder into the system library, I mean into the file system. So I'm going to new, add, add a new folder here, I'm going to call fonts. By the way, the name got to be called fonts. Uh, oh, actually, sorry, did you guys type that already? If you, if you haven't, um, it has to come under resources. So I'm going to create a folder called resources, R-E-S-O-U-R-C-E-S. -E -E and then under resources, I will add uh, the folder called fonts. And then I'm going to do something really fast now. Uh, well, I'm, I, I, there's a folder called fonts. And then inside fonts, I will put the fonts file in there. You can either drag and drop this, or what you can do is you can come out to your useful files. Um, so I can just drag this file and drop it into font. Just like the way we drop, we drop in our, uh, I can put it into font. Uh, come on, let me put it into font. I can drag that file into fonts, or I want to show you another way of doing exactly the same thing. So what I can do here is I can come out here and do a right mouse click and say add existing item. And then I can go search for it. You know, they, they give you very many ways of doing exactly the same thing. So I can, I can add that. Now I have the font. So at this point, I can, I can actually output text, um, uh, text onto, uh, uh, in my application. For example, I want to, um, are we okay with the font file inclusion? We okay? So, so I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to um, give, my, uh, give my, my, my object a name. So I'm going to come out here and say my circle.label. So you can actually uh, la change the label um, of your object. I'm going to uh, call it, say, um, let's say circle. And then if I compile this and run, then my circle has a name. And, and that, so you can, you, can, you, can, you can call your object whatever you want to. And then um, remember, this is not designed so you can build fancy games. It's designed so that you can um, present concepts in programming. So and another, th another way of communicating to the user is just to echo, echo messages. So you can do, there are two status areas that you can echo to. You can echo to the bottom status or the top status. So you know, if I, you echo to the bottom status saying that, um, what, do I, what should I do? Let's say circle is um, add circle dot center. So the operator overload is, is done really well in, in C sharp that you don't have to worry about, um, you know, it's just like Java, I guess. They, they, they all do this now. So I can just echo my circle's position by echoing that way. And I'm echoing this at the bottom. And at the top, I can do something similar. I can, there's an echo to the top status. Um, I don't know what else to echo. Just say hello. So now, now you, you're outputting text. Um, so you can echo the status of your application for your, for your, uh, for your, um, for your user. So we can see that here's my circle. And then here is my, uh, my hello. OK? And then one thing interesting is that if I start moving my circle around, we can see that it, it gives me real-time feedback on what's going on. And then if I just continue to move up, off the screen, it's still drawing. It's still trying to, uh, it, it's still, the, the circle is still being drawn. So once you create an object, it's always there. It's always being drawn. And we are okay with this? You have a question? Do you imply that we should worry about clipping or performance? We should worry about performance when you have to. Meaning that objects not out of sight, out of mind, then you don't have to worry about it. You should worry about it. Um, so so um, one of the things we can do is I'm going to let my circle be, be under my control and everything. And then I'm also going to let it has a velocity. OK, let's create some chaos for ourselves. And if I compile this and run, my circle is going to just move away. And then I, you will see that it's continuously um, it exists in my world. OK, so we need to be a little bit careful about that. So what I want to do is I want to kind of clamp it. I want to clamp my circle within the application bound. So what I can do is this thing. 
I'm going to come out here and call a function. I'm going to come out here and call a function. So I'm going to say, um, um, Bound collide, collide status. So if you just type in B-O-U-N-D, you will see bound collide, collide status. And then let's call that status. So this is an object type, right? And this is my status. Uh, status. And the status of that is equal to I'm going to do world dot clamp at world bound. I'm going to do world.clamp at world bound. And what am I clamping? I'm clamping the circle. So what that will do is it will make sure the circle doesn't go far away. Okay? And if you compile this and run, you see that your circle is always inside the application window. I'm going to compile now and run now. So all I did was is, is the uh, bound collide status. This is a status, and then you tell the world to clamp the, your, uh, your, your circle at, at the bound. Are we okay with that? And you can compile now, you, you run, you see your circle go all the way down to the, uh, I'm going to build my solution, and then I'm going to run my application, and the circle will go boom and get stuck there. It's still trying to move, it just always get clamped there, right? Any question? No question. So um, I'm going to, sh so at this point, it's probably a little bit uh, scary. You know, I, I was, I, I'm, I'm talking about X and A having so many different secret functions. Now we're, we're working with all these really secret functions. Um, so wh what happened is that, um, I'm going to bring this up now. This library that we've developed, if you click on that, We have, um, we have a guide for you on how to work with this library. And my goal today is to show you that you don't need to read through the guide to do everything, OK? Um, there, are, there are tutorials here, step-by-step -step guide of everything we went through basically just now. And some of these examples are slightly more complicated. But um, there are tutorials for you to, to learn the library with. We don't have time to do that. None of us have time to do that. One thing you can do is I'm going to click on this thing. If you are, you are, you are at this tutorial guide page, Come here and click on this compile HTML help. And what it will ask you is that if you want, you know, just say open. And this is what you get. This is a documentation of the library. And I want in the next five minutes to show you that it's really not that difficult to work with this. If you open up the library part of it, You will see that these are, are all the uh, classes, that, the, all the classes in the library, and basically, the library consists of a world, and two primitive type, and nothing else. And I claim that for now, ninety percent of things we need to do, that's all we need. You need to have a world, a circle, and a rectangle. Strictly speaking, you don't even need a circle; you just need to have, have a rectangle. Okay, and um, and if you look at world, what are the things you want to do to your world? The things you want to do to your world. Are the, here are the members. Oh, this is a base class. I'm sorry. If, if, if you look, if you look at the base class of uh, provided functionality, this is the base class. You can echo to the top to the bottom. You can play a queue. When something interesting happens, you can let your user know. Boom, play a queue. You can play background audio. If you want to have something interesting game, it'd be nice to have some background audio. And then you generate random numbers, and that's it. So the base class provides this two, four, six functions and nothing else. Okay? And then in the base class, there's also something called the world. So these are kind of like utilities on the side. And then there's the gamepad that we, we've seen. Gamepad gives you access to all the keys on the gamepad. And then there is the, there's the world class. This world class tells you about information of the world, and if we take a look at that, 
The methods on the, on, on the world class, these are the methods. You can clamp at the world bound. You can collide with the world bound. So clamp meaning that you just want to, 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 to make sure your object don't go outside. And collide tells you if, you if you collided with it. And then you can test if you're outside of the world bound. You can remove all your objects from the draw set. There's something called a draw set. That's why after you create objects, you always show. So you can always add objects in there and, and remove objects from there. You can set the background color, set the background texture, and set world coordinates. It turns out this is kind of like the most interesting function. We do not work in text, we do not work in pixel space. We work in a real space that you can define a coordinate to be whatever you want. And I'll show you what that means. So we can set a world coordinate. And these are the, all the functions we have in the world. And then the world provides you with some properties. And these are like variables you can access. It tells you the min and max position of the world and tells you the dimension. That, that defines the window boundary, right? And that's it. Besides this, you don't really, well, now you don't need to, but then these are kind of basic functionality you need. And then besides that, what we have here is we have the primitive class. That's a super class for the circle and for the rectangle. And then if you look at the primitive class, the, all the methods it have can be, well, these are, these are all the methods, and then there's a property up there. Um, the, the properties are kind of like information you want to get hold of, the center of the geometry. So th th there are two types of information here, the geometric information and then the appearance information. Here it tells you the center uh, coordinate of the primitive, um, and then you can look at its bound. You can look at its uh, max bound and mean bound of the, of the primitive, so you can know the, the, the uh, x and y value of your, of your, um, of your primitive. Um, and then you have um, appearance. You have the, the label color. This label is the text we saw just now. And then you can have outside color. You can change the color of the primitive. And the behavior of the primitive is also defined. And then this is something we've not seen yet, and I want to look at this. After, after we go through this library, I'll show you, show you how to work with this thing. Um, th you can change the velocity of an object. So each primitive has an object. Each primitive has appearance, what is its color. It has geometric information, where it is, how big it is. And it has behavior. Behavior are things like um, speed and velocity. And I'll show you how to work with that like right now. OK, so circles and, and rectangles, they all have similar type of behavior. And that's it. So with that, I, I say that we can build interesting uh, games. Um, the, the, uh, the, the methods are, um, these are some of the methods you, can, you, you have on the primitive. You can, um, you can ask primitive whether it's above another primitive, whether it's below another primitive. You can collide primitives. And then you can control the visibility of primitive by removing it from the, the draw set. And these are all things we'll, we'll look at. My point here is that there are not a whole lot of um, functions that you need to know. There's about a handful of functions, OK? And let, let's, let's look at uh, how, to, how do we can work with one of these. So what I'm going to do now is I, I just came back to my uh, circle class. And this is the, the code we were working on just now. I'm clamping my circle at the boundary. I will show you how we can set up the velocity. We don't even need to update the circle ourselves. So what I'm going to do now here is that at the creation of the circle in initialized world, I am going to say my circle velocity direction, I'm going to give it a new velocity direction of 1, 1. What this will do, it will define where the circle is heading. OK? If you, if you remember a velocity, velocity is a direction and a speed. So here we're just ch ch uh, setting the direction. And what I can do on top of that is I can set the speed. And I want my speed to be, let's say, uh, 2. So my speed is 2. And then I'll tell my circle that I should travel. So I set up the velocity direction, I give you the speed, and I say, hey, you should move. What this will do is it tells the circle every time when update comes, you should move. And I don't need to explicitly change its value here anymore. So I'm going to take these two lines off. I'm going to compile and run, and my circle moves and it gets stuck.
Do we all have a moving circle? You guys realize that we have a, we have a ball bouncing in the window now? How do we bounce that ball? When it collides with a, with a boundary, change its velocity direction. So what we're going to do now is that we're going to look at this status. We're going to look at this status. And the way to do that is I'm going to do a switch statement here. C sharp is really nice in that way. I'm going to do a switch on status. And then case statement, case. Look, I don't have to remember anything. If I type case, it will give me the, uh, the class name. So if you, if you type, just type tab, it will give you that. OK, and then if you type dot, it will ask you which one. You know, in like 20 years, there will be no more real programmers anymore. You know, people working with this, they're not cool. You know, the cool guys are the ones who can do programming with text editor. So, so I'm going to do a bottom. Um, and then as it turned out, top and bottom behave in exactly the same way. So I'm going to uh, put these two cases together, uh, a collide. Top. When you collide with the top or the bottom, you want to flip the y direction. So all I'm going to do now here is I'm going to say my circle dot velocity dot velocity y gets minus circle dot velocity y, and then I will break. And and you know for, for the sake of not getting too bored, um, let's just let's just do that. And now you can compile this and run. And then the circle will get stuck uh, somewhere else. It will not get stuck at the top or the bottom boundary. Are, are we done typing that? If you're done typing that, go figure out how to flip in the X, Y boundary. So now your circle will actually bounce around inside the boundary. I notice a few of us are not programming anymore. Is there, <laughs> is, is there a reason for that? It's tough to keep up, up with you. Uh, OK. No, see, I'm, I'm very interested in knowing whether it's realistic to have people follow what I'm doing. And some of us just say, oh, no, we won't yeah. keep up. Oh, oh, some of us are. You know C sharp, though. Right. I was in XNA with that guy over there. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, so you can teach this class. No, no, no. You are teaching. The no, class. this is. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. It's, but at least we're deciding it. It's easier for us to follow you. Than to just type. To do it, yeah. It's not as important for us to do it. So what happened is that um, I, I, uh, we go through this thing, and then we will, we'll build a block breaker game. And if you guys are interested in another day of this stuff, is that I will give you guidelines on how you can design your own games. And then we spent about three or four hours in designing our own game. So in Guadalajara, what they did was um, professors got together and a group of them designed a uh, worm game, you know, like three or four hours. And then they spent about four hours implementing it. You know, it's like maybe 30, 40 lines of code. It's kind of tricky to implement that stuff. But then once you go through that once, it's really easy. So. Um, if you're still following, then um, I'm just going to uh, m complete this thing. So I'm going to do a left and right here. Um, and left and right. And then, of course, when, when left and right happen, what we want to do is we want to change the velocity to the x direction. Um, I'm going to change the x direction. And what, what you have then. You, is that you have a circle that's that's being bounded by the by the world and it just collides around in the world. And if you if you look at what I've done, it's um, I basically just have like a few lines of code doing this stuff. This is too easy actually to try to follow, right? Well, I guess if you follow this, and then you realize that there's some stuff that that looks easy, but it may, it may not be as easy. Um, the, one, one, one thing we want to do now is that um, that's kind of nice and everything. What I want to do is I want to um, put in audio, 
so that um, when interesting event happen, I want to play some music for, for myself. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to come out to my, my uh, resource area. I'm going to add a new folder called textures. You cannot mis misspell this because the library is so stupid. Well, you, know, you can be easy. If, you, if you're easy to use, then it typically means you're very restrictive. I'm also going to call, put in a folder called audio, A-U-D-I-O. So these are the resources I'm going to have in my system. Okay? So I, I've added in two folders here, an audio folder and a texture folder. And what I'm going to do now is I am going to come out into my, my, uh, the, uh, the, the zip file that, that we unzip. If you look at the zip file that we unzip, um, there is under two, there's a folder called with media. Go into that folder. Um, oh boy. Do you guys have something called useful, useful file in there? Oh, I guess it's in begin template. Under begin template, there's something called useful files. We have that? Go into useful files. Um, I'm going to drag b.png and bg background.png. This can be your photographs, right? You take a photograph, and then I'm going to drag these two files into the textures folder. Now that's part of my project now. I'm also going to drag my bound.wave into my audio folder. Okay, I have to do. I'm going to drag my bound.wave into my audio folder. Come on. It's in my audio folder now. So now all these files are part of my project, and I can start using them. And I'm going to use them like this. I'm going to come into my initialized world, and instead of having a blue background or whatever color background that was, I'm going to set its background texture. So there's a function called a world that set background texture. So I want to have a background information rather than the, the boring world, and this is BG texture. And notice that I don't include the file extension when I specify the name. The extension, well, the, the system is smart enough to figure out what's going on. Do not specify the extension. And then for the circle, instead of a, a, a color circle like that, I'm going to do circle dot texture. I want to give you the texture. And here's my B dot PNG, so I'm going to just call it B. Now if I compile this and run this, I have a B jumping around. Uh, are we okay? Okay, and then when interesting event happen, you want to tell your user that something has happened. And so what you can do here is that when interesting event happen, like when you switch your velocity, you want to tell the user, I'm going to switch out my audio now. Be careful, it's kind of loud. So I'm going to say play. I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, say world. Dot, no, it's, no, it's not the world. Play a Q. I want to play a hint for my user, and I think it's called bound. Yeah, it's called bound. So I'm going to play a Q called bound, and I'm, I'm going to do it on both places. Play a Q. The, 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 what we went through just now is slightly uh, random, but then it's actually slightly on purpose. Is that you, you finish all your logic. When something is kind of working, then you start decorating it with textures and cues. Those things are just useless stuff as far as learning is concerned. Right? But then it, it makes the application look slightly more interesting. So now we have this thing going. Um, oh, because uh, be careful now. All right, just switch it So now this looks like a game now. No, it's not a game. This is pretty boring stuff. But then the, the thing now is that um, what, what we've went through is the, the layer of library we've put on top of XNA introduced semantics. 
So that makes, makes, it allows you to think at a higher level in terms of here's an object in, it's interacting with the world. It's a really, 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 really simple game engine. Okay, I, I, are there any game programming here? <laughs> because it's embarrassing when you say that. But then this lets you do, think at, at a, a higher level and everything we've done here can be taught in intro programming classes. Um, and then if you can, you know, just with a, with a couple of uh, str strokes, then what you can do is you can put in the, uh, the, the uh, resource like texture and audio. The last thing I want to do before we go have food is um, I want to show you the world coordinate system that we're working in. So notice that we didn't specify how big our world is. We just start working. Okay, and then if I'm going to make my circle stop moving around because it's really annoying, um, so I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to bring this up. One thing we, we noticed is that we didn't specify how big our window is. It just came up the size. Okay, and that's by design. You cannot change that. And the reason for that is um, I want to make the library as simple as possible, and the dimension of this window is actually restricted. It follows the Xbox 360 HDTV such that the width is 19 versus the height is 9. I mean 16, 16 to 9, so there's a 16 to 9 ratio for HDTV. So the idea is that you can develop your, your everything and with measurement in this environment, and then when you run on Xbox 360, you just run exactly the same way. Okay, so the dimension is fixed. Another thing is that this position right here is 0, 0, and then as we can see, if, that's zero, zero, if this is 0, 0, the, the, the length here is by default 100. So we're working in a world of between 0 to 100, and then height is between 0 to, I don't know, uh, 9 divided by 16 multiplied by 100. That's our height. We're okay with that? So that's the dimension we're in. And the, the nice thing is that you can change that. You can change that independent of the pixel resolution. So you don't have to worry about how big your display or anything like that. The dimension is always like that. So what we can do here is we can change the resolution. For example, my, my circle's radius is 5. I'm located at x is equal to 50. And as we can see just now, the circle is right smack in the x middle of my application. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to change my world to set world coordinate. So there's a world.set world coordinate function. I'm going to define the lower left corner continue to be 0, 0. It's so convenient to think of it as a 0, 0. I'm going to define the width to be 200. If I do that, then my circle becomes smaller. So it will appear as though it's smaller. So I'm going to define this thing as um, 0, 0. This is my lower left-hand corner. And then the width is, um, I'm going to define my width to be 200. So here I'm defining world coordinate system. The entire window is going to map to 0, 0, and then the width is 200. Notice you can't specify height here. Height is implicit because of the ratio. Is 200, uh, 16 by 9. So if you specify the width, the height will be defined for you. And then if I compile this and run, because my circle is located at 50 and my width is 200, it will be like the first quarter. So if we run this, you will see that the circle is like right here at the first, um, right here is the first quarter, right? And then that's because the entire width is 200. So we can define any kind of a coordinate system we want. Um, are there any question or anything like that? Uh, if, you, if you still have brain for the afternoon, I hope you have brain. Let's have some food, and that will help re replenish. So what we're going to do now is what I want to do in the afternoon is to show you how you can take this thing and start abstracting things and at an even higher level, depending on what you want to do. What we'll go through in the afternoon is we'll go through a very simple design procedure. Um, if you think about like a, punk, uh, a block breaker game, what's involved in the design. This is what we'll, we'll be building in about two hours in the afternoon. I hope we can do this in about one, one hour or so. Um, so we are done with session one and two. In section three, at the end of session three, this is the game we will build. And, and then at any point, you can regenerate the blocks, okay? And then I'm saying that we all have that knowledge right now because you have that knowledge coming in. What we need now is one example of when you see something like this, thing, how do you map what you want to do and into this graphical form? Okay, I'll guide you through that. And 
it takes about an hour. And after that, you can all go build a warm game at home. OK, so I think lunch is here. Um, let's, let's go eat some food. It's officially class is dismissed now. <laughs>